All right, welcome to our next talk. Um, first of all, we have to thank our sponsors for the Diana Initiative, uh, INE Learning Security, Exonius, MongoDB, Juniper, of course, CoreLite, um, Google, We Hack Purple, I love it, um, and Bridge Crew. Uh, we have a great talk coming up with a great speaker. Um, Archana, I am very excited to hear about the security dilemma when migrating to the cloud. And I'm going to keep this introduction very short, um, but Archana has almost over nine years of experience doing security risk in the business world and making all kinds of security decisions. Um, I'm really looking forward to hearing her talk about um, the, the issues that happen when migrating to the cloud. So without further ado, please take it away, Archana. Thank you, Kat. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, it is good morning in uh, Australia in the sunny Sydney here. Um, thank you for joining me here for the talk about security dilemma when migrating to cloud. I am Archana, uh, been introduced uh, already. Uh, just want to uh, give you a glimpse of uh, my world and talk about little um, uh, about myself. I'm a cybersecurity advisor working into the cybersecurity domain almost for a decade now. Uh, I'm currently working as a security assurance manager with a retail company in Sydney. Uh, I'm a former biotech graduate who decided to pursue masters in cyber laws and information security and have been ever since practicing the same. Uh, in addition to the professional focus, I'm also an advocate for women in security uh, community, uh, and uh, I'm passionate about reducing the gap for women security workforce within the organization uh, and continue to contribute uh, towards it. I'm associated with some of the associations, as you can see, within Australia and Middle East for the same. Um, let's quickly cover the agenda for today's session. Uh, I will be talking about key strategic drivers um, for cloud migration um, and approaches for cloud migration followed with ma major technical and security challenges. Uh, I will then take you through the Pandora box, which I call uh, you know, a tale of security dilemma that I, I encountered working, to, working for the organizations and uh, towards their cloud migration journey. Uh, followed with uh, you know, some of the approaches and security controls, uh, mainly uh, focused on the cloud native ones. Uh, and then lastly, we'll conclude the talk with some of the key considerations and learning from the sessions as takeaways. So um, with the ongoing pace of adoption uh, of cloud technologies to either start or scale up the businesses, uh, and especially accelerated uh, you know, during the global pandemic, as we have seen, uh, with working from home requirements, there is more than ever a requirement, uh, you know, for security to scale up to the speed of business platform and technology modernization. Uh, with that said, uh, some of the other st uh, strategic drivers that drives companies to adopt to the cloud, um, you know, apart from uh, apart from everybody doing so, uh, is uh, are some some of it is listed here, which are pay for what you use. You know, it is subscription based, so you basically pay while you use it, uh, use a resource within cloud, and then, you know, once you are done with it, discard it, and you basically don't pay for it anymore. So it's kind of cost effective. Um, quick time to market, uh, you know, businesses are adopting uh, and, you know, releasing their, their services day in and day out uh, to meet to that demand. Uh, uh, they need a scalable reliable platform as well. So that's one of the uh, drivers for them to migrate to cloud. Uh, next is scalability. I have touched a little bit upon it, uh, you know, that uh, way with the growing number of services, with the growing number of portfolios uh, and the customer demands, uh, the companies need to grow in real time um, and then don't have really time to place an order for uh, an application, servers, storages, and stuff. And they need to make the scalable, scalability demands in real time. Uh, compliance to security and privacy guidelines. So whereas we, uh, we all know like well-known cloud service providers, Google, Amazon, Microsoft, they're kind of compliant with a lot of uh, uh, you know, regional, global security, privacy guidelines. 
and adopting to their services uh, you know helps companies transfer uh, those privacy and security obligations or any other uh, you know uh, regional uh, uh, laws uh, and obligations to share with the cloud service providers and hence um, uh, you know they move their workloads to cloud as well as a motivation uh, mobility uh, basically access to the systems from anywhere anytime and from any system uh, not to explain further that this has been uh, kind of uh, you know a key driver uh, during the pandemic as well that people have been working from home from anywhere uh, from any device um, so I, I just want to take you through some of these stats here uh, you know uh, most of the companies uh, start their journey with these goals in place as we have discussed uh, or I call it drivers in place. Uh, however, as they progress, they realize that it takes longer than the, what they thought, uh, you know, for their cloud migration to happen uh, because of scope creep, budget overrun, longer timeline, unmanaged resources, and there are many other reasons, uh, uh, you know, for 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 that lag time. Um, I would say, you know, the journey with the ambition of having an agile, mobile, and scalable workplace works quite well for a startup which are starting their whole soul footprint within cloud or it is comparatively easier for small to medium businesses because of lesser known complexity within their environment however uh, you know i mean for for smbs this could be debatable too but uh, uh, they're, they're lesser complex than a uh, heavy organization because you know none of none of these compares to a well established large organization hosting critical legacy systems and databases with many dependencies and tentacles spread across the traditional infrastructure. Uh, and then they, when they plan to lift and shift this heavy load to the cloud, uh, you know, uh, the, the migration tends to fail if it is not done with the right approach. And some of the facts here, uh, you know, that I've presented, the 68%, um, uh, uh, 73 percent and 62 percent here are some of these stories which are uh, you know uh, talking about some of those cloud uh, journeys which have gone south um and then as you would uh, as you would appreciate that we have been just talking about some of the challenges we've not even touched upon the security which may cause another level of concern and nightmare during the migration uh, so in the following slides, just wanted to set a baseline, and in the following slides, we'll be covering through uh, touching base, uh, touching through some of the security and technology challenges. Um, and then, uh, but that doesn't mean, uh, you know, there is uh, uh, that we can't get uh, the cloud migration working right. All that is required is the right people, right approach, and the right controls for the migration efforts to thrive within cloud. Uh, let's look at some of the migration approaches here, which have been standardized and classified into six categories based on Gartner's uh, 5R approach. Um, as as you can see in the, uh, this is a well-known uh, uh, you know diagram for demonstrating the these uh, 5R, 6R approaches uh, for cloud migration. Um, so while planning the migration, uh, you know, one just to start from the uh, from the scratch. Um, while planning the migration, it is important to perform the asset portfolio discovery and planning exercise. This means that the company should first identify applications that they want to migrate. Uh, prioritize which ones uh, to move first, you know, depending on the overall architecture, the complexities because of the interdependencies, uh, licensing arrangements, and many more. Uh, ideally, as a straightforward approach, it is always a good idea, uh, you know, for companies to start with lower complexities like the lightweight, virtualized, uh, you know, service-oriented uh, 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 applications. Uh, as a quick win to open a path with good learning experience for migrating rather, uh, you know, complex uh, systems later. Um, the identification and prioritization for migration should not be a one-time activity. There should be a, uh, there should be, uh, you know, an a living and breathing uh, uh, approach, or there should be a living and breathing activity rather um, uh, to be able to accommodate any changes, uh, you know, if the project requires so. And then now that we have set the baseline, uh, you know, that, that there is migration that is going to happen, uh, I just want to quickly take you through these six uh, approaches and, uh, uh, and 
let you know what these are. So let's starting with the rehosting, which is lift and shift. Um, uh, this approach involves, uh, you know, just just lifting uh, the, the the application from your data center and moving it to another's data center, which is cloud. Um, and uh, uh, just just rehosting without doing any architectural changes. Um, so why companies do so? Uh, because you know, most of them, they estimate some level of benefit, uh, uh, you know, rehosting these applications to the cloud. Uh, next comes replatforming. It's uh, the yellow color here. I'm not sure if that's too visible. Um, so replatforming is an optimization approach uh, after mostly adopted after lift and shift, uh, where, you know, uh, the companies utilize cloud native capabilities to meet the functional requirements. So for example, you're replacing your on-premise uh, database with an Amazon RDS uh, relation database uh, there, or similar capabilities uh, you know, that is provided uh, uh, by some other cloud-native capabilities with the platform that you're moving to. Uh, refactoring or re-architecting involves um, writing the application from the scratch. Um, and then just to have more automation, more agility, improve resiliency, and be able to utilize that cloud uh, uh, cloud technology more uh, to achieve the drivers and goals that we saw in the initial place. Um, next comes repurchasing in orange here, which is uh, you know it's it's simple that you know, you repurchase the application that you want to migrate. So, for example, uh, you know, well-knowns are uh, migrating the CRM systems, uh, whichever CRM you're using on-prem, to uh, uh, to Salesforce, or NHR system to Workday, Zoho, and you know, there are many more. Um, next comes here in the grays. There are these two in gray that you see here: retire and retain. Uh, so during the application migration, companies may come across to the applications or features that are no longer required and can be retired. Um, and then the other one is retain, uh, which includes uh, the set of applications which are not prioritized of, for migration uh, because it, was, it is not aligned with the goals of migration at this point in time. However, it can be considered later. Um, so so as, as we've looked at all these migration scenarios, I just want to concentrate, um, you know, a bit on uh, and grab your attention on the three migration approach, which is rehosting, replatforming, and refactoring, as it will form the basis uh, to understand the, the scenario that we're going to talk about uh, in the further slides. So let's look at lift and shift uh, or rehosting uh, and and understand some of the complexities that uh, that comes part of it. Uh, you know, as I mentioned, uh, you know it is a widely adopted approach for migrating critical and legacy applications to cloud. Uh, when commercial of the uh, of the shelf applications are migrated using lift and shift, the limitations of applications such as um, you know lack of scalability. Uh, integrations uh, and other, you know, flexible opportunities that the cloud service provides, uh, you know, you tend to, uh, uh, you know, resist it or it, it is not really compatible uh, with it. Uh, and also with the lift and shift, uh, you know, you retain those network complexities within your network uh, because you're just lifting and shifting the applications to cloud. However, you may retain some of those, uh, you know, network connectivity with the on-premise networks and other components that that application depends on. Um, as I mentioned, dependent applications and databases, uh, you know, so you retain those connectivity uh, uh, with, with your on-premise system uh, to have uh, those dependent applications and databases easily run because you don't want to compromise on the overall architecture or, you know, the, the availability of that particular application that you're dependent on. Uh, hence, what happens is uh, with with its uh, inbuilt limitation, uh, uh, you know, it is, uh, it, it the companies uh, have limited utilization of cloud resources, uh, and hence, um, you know, result in long time uh, long term failure if uh, you know they, they tend to find it going over budget, you know, running uh, uh, over time on the project timelines, and it requires certain level of capabilities and skills. Um, uh, you know, however, you know, not as as the as much as the other approaches. 
Um, next step, uh, uh, so replatforming. Uh, so as we covered before, it is a next step to lift and shift. Uh, you know, it is mostly an optimization approach uh, by using cloud native capabilities. Uh, it requires specialized skills, hence it is a bit time consuming, uh, uh, understanding, learning uh, those skills, testing those skills. Um, since, as I mentioned, it requires more specialized skills, there are increased chances of errors and misconfigurations. Um, uh, you know, however, if it is configured properly, it provides increased resilience because you're utilizing more cloud native services. Um, it enables long term cost saving, um, and, uh, which is one of the goals, as we saw, or one of the drivers for moving to cloud. And it provides easy, uh, easy adaptability to changes uh, and respond quickly uh, you know, to the requirements and changes within the organization. Uh, the last one is refactoring, uh, which is rewriting the applications from the scratch. It also uses uh, you know, the cloud native capabilities and other, uh, you know, other capabilities as well. Uh, automation is basically the foundation here. So, you know, uh, the, the, the code is the basis. Uh, hence, you know, you need more specialized skills, uh, you know, to be able to automate uh, all your requirements um, uh, from the technical and security aspect. However, some of it from the security aspect will look a bit later too. Um, and then since it requires such, such specialized skills with, with the migrations that are happening, adopting such approaches, you know, tend to end up in misconfigurations, um, you know, unintentional errors. Um, however, you know, if it is done properly, um, the migration provides, uh, it's, it's kind of most cost uh, effective. And uh, you know it is really adaptable and more prone, uh, and provides uh, uh, you know good amount of or uh, it's if provide effective change management as well. Um, so now that I've covered the migration approach and its complexity, uh, I just uh, you must be wondering where is security among all these pick and choose exercise. Um, I want to take you through some of the common security challenges encountered during the migration work. Uh, as you can see, I've highlighted, I've tried highlighting one here with the meme that I've taken uh, uh, from Google. <laughs> um, so which is, uh, which is in itself is a nightmare for, uh, for a lot of project managers and technology team wherein, you know, hey, you plan for the migration, but you forgot to engage security there. Um, after all the hard work is done around, you know, defining the migration approach, migration drivers, and then here you call security and security comes and says, oh, it's risky. Don't go there. Um, well, let's look at some of the security challenges. Uh, one is defined here. Let's look at the other ones. Um, I call them security dilemma and hence, you know, the talks uh, comes into picture. Um, so the dilemma will we'll just cover one by one. Uh, the first and foremost and the most important, as I see, uh, you know, for establishing the baseline for any security program or, 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 you know, just understanding what security control is required, we need visibility. So uh, it simply is, you know, what you can't see, you really can't protect. Um, so security often faces challenge with respect to, uh, you know, asset mapping within cloud because of its dynamic nature of the instances, changing IPs complexity of the architecture, mapping accesses, uh, you know, and managing the changes within cloud. Um, data flow, uh, you know, you don't know where data flow is, what's the classification of it, um, you know, so it's, it's, it gets difficult to, you know, put those controls in place. Um, the next one comes keeping up with the rapid changes. <clears throat> uh, it's, Again, like we've covered this before, uh, that the companies who are adopting the cloud technology need, uh, you know, that agility and flexibility to be able to uh, develop and release the services on demand. Uh, but from the security aspect, the traditional checklist-based controls, uh, you know, that we need, we have in place for our data center or on-premise systems for security assurance before any release of the services to production uh, are not really sufficient here. Uh, this what happens is like it, uh, uh, the services are released without uh, you know appropriate security checks, leaving the low-hanging fruits for the adversaries to gain uh, access within your system. Um, 
Next comes the in, uh, inconsistent security policy and governance controls. Uh, so, of course, you know, it, it all is kind of interlinked, you know, as we are taking through it one by one. Uh, but inconsistent security policies and controls here means that for your data center, you know, once you do define a, a security policy or lay down those security controls uh, and governance processes, it is based off a certain risk, uh, risk assessment approach. Uh, you define those risks, uh, you know, uh, you understand the risk exposure of your data center while you're moving to the cloud with other challenges in place uh, and, and while, you know, the migration approaches are adopted. Um, the, the right view of the security risk is not identified and then hence, uh, you know, the applicability of these security policies and extension of these governance controls uh, and security guidelines becomes a challenge for security teams or security architects to basically, uh, you know, move these uh, or make these controls applicable within cloud. Um, next one is the dependency on traditional uh, security controls. While, uh, well, we covered some of that in, you know, keeping up with the rapid changes. Uh, however, you know, as I mentioned uh, before, point in time risk assessment is almost impossible due to the growing number of internal and external services, uh, dependency, runtime dynamics, continuous delivery, uh, you know, polyglot software development adopted, um, and, and thus it forces, uh, you know, companies to make a trade off between speed and security and exposing the organizations to unnecessary risk. Uh, next is misconfiguration. Uh, uh, you know, of course, like with, with the adoption requires some level of skills and then, you know, the lack of skills uh, or negligence uh, within the cloud because you're, you're spinning up the systems day in and day out, bringing down the systems day in and day out. You know, the misconfigurations tend to happen uh, and which, you know, leaves significant loopholes and it's hard for security, uh, uh, you know, architects or security teams to manage uh, this level of, you know, misconfigurations. Uh, and the linked, uh, uh, another linked dilemma with the mis misconfigurations and lack of visibility is lack of adequate monitoring and incident response. Um, so basically you don't know what, uh, what systems are existing out in, uh, within cloud, what services have you procured, uh, since, you know, not much visibility is there within, within the environment and hence, uh, you know, uh, maybe the logs are not enabled or the monitoring is not appropriately configured and hence you know if there is any event or incidents happening within those instances you know it, it just goes unnoticed uh last but certainly not the least is the uh access control uh, uh along with you know everything else that we've been seeing um uh, you know, access control tend to be a miss. Uh, you don't know what privileges uh, are assigned to which users. Uh, although, you know, the cloud technologies provide granular level of these access controls. However, the configuration becomes a challenge without adequate, you know, visibility, without understanding who needs access to what uh, and practicing those least privileged need to know, uh, you know, becomes a challenge. Um, so now that we have looked at, uh, you know, all the security uh, challenges there. I want to take you to the uh, migration scenario here, which is proposed to lift and shift the critical application from data center to cloud. Uh, the objective for this migration was to scale the existing application to enhance its performance and capacity in cloud with the growing number of, uh, you know, services portfolio for the organization. Uh, to understand the problem better, uh, let's consider that the set of applications which are hosted here in the data center uh, uh, are critical customer facing applications. And due to its criticality, the migration was required to be done with minimum or no change to the overall architecture. Uh, however, to achieve this scalability and enhance the performance of the application, it was important to consider replatforming and refactoring some of uh, you know, the associated applications uh, and dependent components. Um, hence, while lift and shift resulted with better, uh, you know, retaining uh, some of the data center ingress, egress traffic uh, via on-premise, uh, you know, security protection uh, systems like firewalls, uh, load balancers and all, uh, the migration architecture and roadmap also included optimizing the application uh, and dependent integration by leveraging cloud native capabilities. And later on, 
refactoring it, uh, uh, you know, to enhance the functionality and overall performance. So as you see in the architecture here, um, you know, the security challenges that we have discovered before uh, seems quite valid and in inevitable. Uh, so, but the irony here is that this is just the uh, tip of the iceberg shown that I've, I've tried uh, putting together. The actual architecture actually looked uh, way better and way complicated than this. Uh, so now that we have looked at the security challenges in such architecture and such migration work, um, you know, I want to take you to uh, take you through the approach uh, uh, by including secure by design principles as where you know the as security architects or security professionals we can work our business teams uh, which are planning to migrate to cloud and make it easier from securities aspect uh, the first uh, the, the first step starts with uh, you know uh, security teams to be engaged early on within the project not being uh, you know the latecomers it is important for business and uh, technical teams also to engage security uh, at, a, at an early stage which will ensure clear understanding of the migration drivers and align the security strategic goals with the overall uh, you know, organization goal. Uh, what it will do is it will facilitate better communication and collaborations as well with the relevant teams where you know, security teams will be able to identify the scope um, uh, and work with the solution architects to understand the conceptual and detailed design and roadmap for the migration, which will lay the grounds for security team to perform uh, you know, appropriate threat profiling and assess the risk to the applications and platforms. Um, and then uh, you know, identify the adequate control applicability within their cloud uh, migration uh, you know, while you're migrating or uh, you know, in the process of migration or post-migration uh, you know, control applicability. Um, this would then be defined uh, you know, for the secu security architects or security professionals engaged in the cloud migration work. Uh, uh, the work would be to define these control guardrails based off the control applicability and risk assessment that you performed before. And then define, uh, you know, measure those guardrails and effectiveness of security, those security controls with you know, defining the reporting matrices uh, and these periodic matrices. Now, how you would achieve these, uh, you know, all of these controls uh, and then control assurance around your cloud workloads is to keep optimizing and improving by adopting cloud native uh, solutions and capabilities and then optimizing configurations um, uh, and, you know, embedding security into the uh, DevOps cycle uh, to avoid much of the manual intervention here and then have it as automated as possible. So from next uh, slide onwards here, I want to concentrate on some of, and I want to showcase some of the cloud native controls to achieve, uh, you know, the approach that we have walked through here. Um, so one of the security controls uh, and the basic one uh, is, is to have, um, you know, visibility and, you know, just to resolve the challenge that we saw uh, uh, to mitigate the lack of visibility there to perform the uh, adequate risk profiling is the asset identification. Uh, so the example shown here uh, is basically, uh, you know, uh, is related to asset tagging uh, and keeping, uh, uh, providing the asset tagging and having your uh, the CMDB of your asset, which involves, you know, keeping track of the owner, team, application stack, lifecycle policies and environment. Um, so the example uh, which is demonstrated here is the automated asset tagging, which consists of, uh, you know, as you can see, the Lambda function here, uh, which captures uh, the API events. Uh, you know, if if there is, say, a new EC2 instance that's created as part of the auto scaling uh, functionality, uh, it will capture the uh, capture the traffic um, uh, and then analyze. Uh, you know, and create the tag uh, uh, using the owner's value of the username uh, and, and the EC2, and then provide the tagging for that EC2 instance as part of the auto scaling group. Um, once you've tagged these, uh, you know, for, for uh, us as security professional to be able to monitor these uh, uh, assets as these are being created, it, it gets easier to keep track of the overall data flow and then hence, uh, you know, identify the, the risk exposure level uh, of these instances and in the real time. 
so this is the basic one which uh, where you can leverage the cloud native capabilities to be able to tag those assets and identify and get the visibility of uh, your cloud infrastructure. Uh, similar to that, next one that I want to show, uh, as I mentioned about laying the guardrails and um, you know defining the minimum security requirements uh, within the cloud, and then achieving those uh, and keeping track of those uh, with the adequate automation. I've tried uh, showing the example here, uh, you know, just just for the configuration changes, for example where if uh, uh, if any configuration changes in any of your workload occurs there's this pick by you know aws config which monitors the uh, the configuration if you have enabled uh, uh, which monitors those configuration compliance within your workloads amazon guard duty is the ids uh, intrusion detection system that picks up uh, uh, you know uh, all the logs and then provides the behavioral analysis uh, so these these basically these components picks up the logs from uh, uh, from particular resources, for example, where this configuration has happened, uh, and would provide you if you have configured just for detection, would provide you the notification that hey something uh, hey your workload has gone uh, you know is misconfigured or is not compliant to the guardrails or the security guardrails that you've defined. Uh, so please have a look at it. Or if you have enabled the Lambda functions and custom, um, uh, you know, prevention rules there, uh, of course, then it will prevent uh, or it will revert the uh, the configuration back to, uh, you know, what it, what it was supposed to be and provide you with the notifications. Um, moving forward is, uh, you know, one of the uh, one of the most important controls, uh, you know, having the segmented network architecture. Uh, so basically, you know, create uh, the critical instances in separate account. Uh, don't have you know dev test prod in one all hosted within one account. Uh, you know, segregate those. So if, for example, uh, you know, out of this picture, an example, if you want, uh, you know, all your logs to be collected from your cloud instances within an S3 bucket, you wouldn't want that S3 bucket, uh, you know, to be accessible to everybody. So you would want that uh, S3 bucket to be hosted in a specialized, uh, uh, you know, account uh, in, in a segregated environment, which is, you know, accessible to least people as possible or automated. Uh, you know, you have more controls over it. Um, next one is uh, implementing least privilege network. Uh, so what I've shown, uh, I've tried showcasing here is, uh, you know, you can you can adopt some of the cloud technologies such as uh, you know having security groups uh, having network acls uh, to segregate uh, and you know control the uh, network ingress and egress traffic movement between two instances so as an example here i've tried showcasing that how using uh, you know the firewalls uh, the transit gateways these are cloud native solution for amazon uh, web services, uh, you know, you can segregate the traffic and control the traffic between two uh, virtual private clouds or different accounts, uh, maybe hosted in different regions, or you know, the you can control those VPC pairing within the same region as well, uh, just to control that network traffic and uh, you know reduce the overall risk surface. Um, so. In lines with that, like I've demonstrated a lot of security solutions, uh, you know, which are cloud native. Uh, and some of these uh, I just want to highlight, uh, you know, as in, in note uh, uh, is that some of the shared security capabilities that are available uh, within your cloud service provider. I've taken an example of Amazon Web Services here, but, you know, the similar capabilities are provided by other cloud service providers as well. Um, so some of these common security uh, capabilities are federated uh, uh, IAM, locking and monitoring, incident response, key management, and there would be many more. Um, I've shown, showcased, uh, uh, you know, a config, uh, AWS config as a capability to take an example, uh, you know, of monitoring, continuously monitoring uh, the, the configuration compliances. Uh, you know, which uh, which is monitored through AWS config if that is enabled, and then you get notified. Uh, you know, as we've seen in the previous slides as well. Um, so some of the uh, some of the key takeaways from this session as we are wrapping it up is, uh, you know, having the right management oversight because they are the decision makers, and you know, aligning 
uh, uh, the security uh, intentions and security objectives uh, during the migration or while planning the migration with, with the overall business objectives comes a long way because you basically protect, secure, or working towards you know enabling the business. Setting the right security guardrails, you define those minimum security requirements uh, you know, based off your risk appetite and the risk assessment uh, by understanding uh, you know, the approach and understanding what you're adopting uh, within the cloud while migration. Um, the other one is automation, like going forward, uh, you know, as you adopt, enhance your skills, uh, you know, keep automating these controls because um, within the cloud, with the rapid changes, of course, it is difficult to keep track of everything with the traditional, uh, uh, you know, security methodologies. Um, then, you know, developing and enhancing these skills uh, and capabilities with the continuous, uh, you know, clouds releasing continuous capabilities. It is important, uh, you know, to develop those capabilities and embed, have a team which is, uh, you know, understanding of the security controls and how to achieve them through the automations and capabilities that are available with the cloud platform that, you know, your companies plan to adopt to. Um, Security should be embedded in the devs, uh, DevOps cycle. We call it set DevOps, DevSecOps. Uh, you know, it's just part of it. Um, it comes to the automation as well. So security is inbuilt in the in your CI/CD pipeline. Basically, uh, you know, everything is developed, everything is checked uh, in the real time. So it doesn't have to be a point in time exercise. And the last one is that security is standardized across the asset lifecycle. So once your asset is uh, incepted, so we saw the asset tagging, uh, you know, you create an asset till that asset is uh, decommissioned, uh, you know, you have the security built uh, uh, and you're managing it well, you have the right visibility to it. So with that, uh, you know, this concludes my presentation uh, into the challenges that are faced by security architects while you're working with the teams, uh, you know, in their cloud migration journey. Uh, a detailed paper, uh, you know, on this topic uh, as I'm consolidating and making it more detailed uh, uh, would be available by September. And then, uh, you know, at the end, just want to say thank you for attending my talk. You have my LinkedIn and email here. I'll be available on Slack as well. And I'm ready to take any questions now. Thank you so much, Rachana. That was awesome. Um, I learned a lot there. Um, I, I am a cloud person and that gave me some things to think about. Um, we do have a question here. Um, do you have any recommendations for getting DevSecOps and DevOps working toward the same goals and working better together? Yes. Um, so, you know, I mean, the answer answer basically lies uh, in the question that you know you both the devops and devsecops are working to achieve the same goal that is the business objective if it is for moving to cloud or operating in cloud and retaining that cloud environment uh, so you know when you're working towards the same objective embedding uh, uh, the challenge basically comes you know because security is adopting certain guidelines and checklist based approaches uh, so when they tend to understand how developers are working, uh, how developers are de developing those codes, it is easier to embed those security static tests, automated tests, uh, you know, as part of your development cycle and embedding those security checks, uh, you know, as part of those CI CD pipelines that the DevOps is working towards uh, and making sure that, you know, your security is in built in the uh, in the part of any solution that is being released uh, you know out there for customers to utilize i hope that answers i'm going to throw out my own question um yes. i work a lot with um developers engineers and such that are always thinking that the security team is just out to get them <laughs> Essentially, um, especially when it comes to the cloud, because they just don't get it that the cloud is, it's a little bit different, but it's still just exposed computers and so on. Um, yeah. Do you have any suggestions on 
getting those engineers kind of on board, especially when you're dealing with the DevSecOps pipeline? How do you how do you tend to sell security to them in a positive way? Um, it is, uh, you know, it is. It all comes down to understanding the exposure level, uh, you know, or risk exposure level of uh, for that particular goal, as I mentioned, that you're working towards. So the developers are developers and engineers are working to, you know, develop those capabilities for the organizations uh, to utilize for their purposes. And if there is, uh, you know, if the security as security architects and professionals, first of all, it is important for us to, uh, you know, not really police them. And then when you, uh, they, the the problem comes, you know, when we go to them, we, we go to these developers and tell them, hey, I mean, this is a compliance obligation, please, you know, stick to it. Uh, that's when it becomes policing, which is, you know, not really welcome. So working towards, uh, you know, the same goal, achieving, you know, that particular solution, it is important for security professionals uh, to talk in a risk based approach and then make the engineers understand, you know, that, hey, I mean, uh, if, if we do this way, certain things, I mean, this is, uh, you know, the kind of risk exposure uh, that our solution might have. And then hence, you know, we require these minimum controls. It need not be, you know, as restrictive as, it, uh, as you know, sometimes we tend to provide. Um, you know, it has to be catering to the business requirement. It has to be understanding those engineers' point of view, uh, and yet, uh, you know, embedding those controls uh, at minimum to mitigate those risks at a, at an acceptable level uh, for that organization is, you know, an approach that can that works. Uh, you know, with the engineers uh, that I work with, uh, you know, and I work with day in and day out and, you know, just just understanding and focusing on that particular risk and mitigating that to an acceptable level. It doesn't have to be, uh, you know, particularly a compliance with an approach, which tends to, you know, put them in another uh, another way or, you know, just, just divert from the overall objective. Good point. Um, we have another question up here. Do you have any particular references for people coming up to speed on the security tools in the different cloud environments? Um, let me read that question. Do you have any particular references for people coming up to speed on cloud tools? Ah, okay. Um, yeah, it's, uh, you know, if, if you're starting up as, um, you know, a security professional working around using these cloud technologies. Uh, you know, there are a lot of labs available uh, out there. Uh, I particularly, uh, you know, I, I particularly follow a lot of AWS cloud native work and capabilities. So, uh, you know, uh, if you go out to their own websites and there are a lot of uh, trainings and, uh, you, you know, uh, I think like classrooms, uh, that that uh, you know you can have and leverage these tools and work out in real time, uh, and then see for yourself like how these uh, configurations and tools are basically working within cloud. I'll I'll add one into that that I use a lot in various cloud environments. It's called Scout Suite, um, yeah. open source by NCC, and it is a great way to audit your environments regardless of AWS, GCP, Azure, etc. And it really gives you a good overall picture of what your environment looks like. And if you have any settings that are misconfigured, which tends to be a big problem. Oh. Yeah. Um, any other questions, anybody? Well, this was a great talk. Thank you again so much. Um, and thanks to all of our sponsors. And thank you all for attending. Um, this has been a very long day, but it's been a very productive day with a lot of great talks throughout. And just a special thanks, Archana, because, um, you know, this is, um, I think it is the last talk of the day, right? I don't have the schedule in front of me. Ah, I should do that. Um, but is it? Uh, I, I think so, yes. For the yeah, I think it is. And, and it's always hard to be the last talk of the day. So, you know, I give you credit for doing that and doing it so well. So thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you, Dan. We'll thank you all for attending. Uh, for more questions, I'm, I'm uh, still on Slack. Oh, oh, there, is, there is one more, I was just told. There is one more talk. So, yes, sorry, I, I oh. missed that. Yeah.
There is one more. And what is it? It is, ah, leaders lower the ladder. Uh, no, that's, it's, yeah, leaders lower the ladder. And that is on stage one. And that is this stage. So that will be coming up in just a few minutes. So stick around and don't forget tomorrow is day two. And there's lots more talks. Please visit the expo. Um, talk to the to our sponsors. Talk to the villages. Everything's going on. Lots of good stuff. Thank you all. Have a great rest of your conference.